Marshall here. Welcome back to the YouTube edition of the Realignment Podcast. My guest today is the author, Benjamin Harold. He has a new book out. It's called Disillusioned. It's all about the role of suburbia in the modern United States and how that topic relates to the American dream. Benjamin has a central thesis that I think is really interesting and controversial. He thinks that if we actually look at the suburbs, moving beyond just the obvious culture war debates, they are actually pretty much like a Ponzi scheme. If we're looking at the actual economic foundations, we're actually looking at the fact that in many ways, like the schools don't work the way they should have, and people just are constantly finding themselves moving on and moving on and moving on until someone's stuck with the bill. That just becomes a really interesting conversation that I think a lot of people, myself included, who are thinking about moving to the suburbs have not thought about in the first place. So we've got everything here, the American dream, culture wars, and the state of everything post-COVID. Hope you all enjoy this conversation, and I really recommend you check out Benjamin's book. Ben Harold, welcome to The Realignment. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So here's how I want to start the conversation. I'd love for you to articulate where you think the suburbs are in the American popular imagination right now. By that, I mean, if it's the 40s and 50s, we're going to talk about Levitons and then, of course, like the Levitons and, of course, the uh, highway system. If it's the 70s, we're going to discuss white flight. If the 1990s, it's the American beauty era. So the suburbs are hell holes that are constraining us of our commutes and everything like that. And then post-2008, they're also a symbol of financial excess and a broken system when it came to subprime mortgages. 2020-2024, where is everything right now? Well, I think that's a, a great way to lead into it because what I've come to understand is that uh, kind of all of these things are happening at once in suburbia um, and suburbia is not real well equipped to handle that. So the way I've kind of started thinking about it is, you know, suburbs remain a place um, that are very central to the American dream. We as families invest so many of our hopes and ambitions and visions of the future into the suburbs and the schools. Like that's still the place we associate with the good life. And that's a very powerful thing. But what we see now is that there's these different uh, and often competing dreams that are now colliding in suburbia as demographics change, as economics change, as the ability to keep just moving away from problems out further into the countryside diminishes. It's almost like a collision of competing dreams. And I think suburbia is going uh, undergoing kind of an identity crisis as a result. Yeah. So here's something that'd be really interesting. As I was researching after I finished your books, I think this is such a fascinating topic. I came across a bunch of RIP the suburbs articles that came out and books that came out right after the financial crisis. This is also coinciding with like kind of the reurbanization of America that if you kind of bought a lot of the premises, I don't think this book in our discussion right now would make as much sense 10 years later. So basically, why did the suburbs as a concept survive past maybe the potential reckoning moment that you had after the financial crisis? I think a big part of that is that the suburbs have always been more complicated um, than we give them credit for. We kind of have these, these mythologies uh, around the suburbs that we adopt of, you know, it's all uniform class and race and culture and so forth. And that is really not the case anymore. It has not been for some time. And so I think our conceptions of suburbia have gone out of date. But the reality is it remains, the, the you know, suburbs remain these kind of dynamic places where all of the other fights that are central to, you know, opportunities that are central to America and the American dream and the promises we make to our citizens, they're very much alive and active in suburbia. We've just really trained ourselves to think of suburbs as a place where nothing matters or where things don't happen, that the real world is happening somewhere else, whether that's cities or our rural areas. Um, and, and so I think a lot of it just kind of comes down to like, wait, we need to shed some of our own myths about the suburbs so that we can see them for what they really are, which is really complicated, dynamic places. Yeah. And the way you write the book, you're telling five different stories at once, different characters, different parts of the country, different iterations of the suburbs and the tensions they're in. So maybe through the lens of these different stories, like what are some different visions of the suburbs that we should have in our head so that we don't basically say the suburbs trademark and kind of mischaracterize what's actually happening? Yeah, there's a couple ways we can think about that. So one is there's kind of different types of suburbs. We have inner ring suburbs that, you know, often were from the 30s, 40s, 50s. They were, um, you know, at one point they were the newest and greatest uh, kind of in residential housing. And now we would often consider them kind of old and small and outdated, you know, the, the kind of housing stock in those places. So there's inner ring suburbs, but there's also these- And quick you know, thing, state what is an example of an inner ring suburb that people have probably heard of maybe? 
Well, Compton, California is one that we focus on in the book. And again, it's so long, far removed from that original suburban history that we kind of don't think about it as a suburb anymore. Because again, our kind of myths get in the way. But it's actually this place that has a really rich history as a bedroom community of Los Angeles and was all white up until the 1950s. And so, you know, now it's it's turned into something totally different, but it's still a suburb. It's still laid out in the same way that it was originally. Um, so, you know, there's that, but there's also these kind of like stately uh, streetcar suburbs from the late 19th century that were really moneyed places. And you'd see that um, in Evanston, Illinois, which is one of the communities we focus on in the book. And then I think, you know, we, the stereotypes we have about suburbia are not grounded in totally in fiction. And so, you know, we often think about kind of, you know, sprawl, you know, shopping centers and malls and parking lots. And, you know, that's fairly accurate in Gwinnett County outside Atlanta, which is one of the communities that I focus on too, of, you know, it was really a place that built up in the seventies and eighties and reflects that now, even though we're in the 2020s. And so like, just to put a fine point on that, um, there's a large mall in Gwinnett County um, that is now uh, mostly abandoned. And it was actually used as a set for the TV show, Stranger Things, <laughs> for this kind of 80s nostalgia kind of going back. So it's that's still the physical infrastructure in a lot of those places. Um, so yes, suburbs are a really, really diverse set of places. And the dreams that animate each of them can be different too. So, you know, I think originally uh, much of suburbia especially post-war suburbia, was really built on this kind of dream and vision of white racial advantage and exclusion, excluding everyone else. Kind of let's get as many opportunities as we can, financial and otherwise, and use them up as much as we can, um, but not let other groups take part in those. Um, and so that obviously was a, a central focus of the civil rights movement. And what we saw is that in many ways, the opening up of suburbia was kind of one of the culminating achievements of the civil rights movement, where you had good public schools that were, had historically been racially segregated, now open to everyone in the housing markets along with them. And then there's this kind of third dream of integration that has, you know, there's a persistent through line throughout suburbia of trying to make these places that in many ways have many advantages, the site where we actually make, you know, that dream of integration work. Evanston, Illinois is a perfect example of that. But in all three cases, you know, what I found with the families that I followed living in these communities is that the, the kind of visions and dreams that animated them all felt like they were being pulled out from under their feet. So I think what's interesting, I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas. So I'd love for you to talk about like the Dallas, Texas suburbs, exurbs. Um, so I think we'll get into the Ponzi scheme argument um, in a second here. But I think setting the stage for the dynamic in that part of the country, especially, is relevant here. Yeah, so the family I followed in uh, North Dallas suburbs up in Collin County, um, they're a white family named the Beckers. And so they're um, conservative politically and culturally, um, very strong in their Methodist faith. Um, they are a little bit older in their mid 40s and late or in early 50s when I met them. And they're pretty well, pretty affluent. They both have worked in, um, you know, they met when they were bankruptcy consultants and they were actually working together on the Enron project project after you know Enron fell apart. And so, you know, they bring kind of with them the sense of like suburbia is kind of a sense of like the suburbs they want is maybe one or two steps removed from their small town, Texas upbringing. They still want a community where, you know, everyone kind of knows each other. Everyone gets along. We do potlucks. We walk the kids to school together. The kid, we see our families in church on the weekends. Um, we all kind of share the same values. And so they, they, in the early 2000s, right when they were getting married, they moved into Plano, Texas, thinking that that's what they were getting. But by the time their oldest son is ready to start first grade, the demographics of the local elementary school have almost totally flipped. And it kind of, the, they start him there in, in first grade and his experience is not what they want. And so it kind of sends them on this journey of trying to find some place where they can find both the education they want for their children, each of whom has very different personalities and needs, but also kind of reflect the values and visions that they carry with them. And those two things are sometimes in conflict. And it ultimately leads them out of Plano to a new exurban community called Lucas that's really kind of just being built up um, in the 2000s, um, about 30, 40 miles north of Dallas. And so, you know, it's the kind of place where you have these large, massive 5,000 square foot homes set on large lots. And, it, you know, you can kind of feel that country uh, a little bit more where you see, you'll see longhorns grazing on the side of the road. You'll see kind of open expansion of pasture probably won't be there for long, but right now it still has that feeling of like, okay, this is the quote unquote traditional suburban dream that we often kind of think of first. Yeah. And I think that perfectly leads us into the conversation around why you're arguing in so many respects that the uh, vision of suburbia that so many people have is actually kind of built around uh, 
a Ponzi scheme. And I'll just say like separately, like as I was reading the book, this uh, really viral TikTok went around where it was showing like a, an amazing new high school in Prosper, Texas. Um, just like the cavernous people, a lot of people have probably seen this book. This is this massive cavernous high school. Um, and just once again, I think a good book will help give you a new lens to look at through the world. Um, the question I'm asking myself is, okay, what is the financing structure and what does the actual underlying, uh, what needs to keep happening to like make this go on and support this structurally? So yeah, we'd love you to make this. And, and, and the last thing I add on this is I don't, my, my biggest beef with a lot of like the anti-suburbs books from the 2010s is that they weren't, they, they weren't empirical. They were kind of just like values driven to sort of millennials want to mm -hmm. live in the urban regions and they want cheap Ubers and they want to go to WeWork and then they have their sweet green, mm -hmm. which A, like let's put aside zero interest rate phenomenon debates, but that's kind of a values-based debate that's not provable. I just love the Ponzi scheme argument because it's actually something we could really understand. So yeah, please take it from there. Oh, I'll start with you know, again, kind of staying in uh, in North Dallas for a minute because you mentioned Prosper, and that's kind of right next door uh, to the districts that I ended up following, and kind of much of the same dynamic is happening there. And so, what you see is that you know there's this community. It's not even really a community; it's sections of three other or several other communities. But the, the school district is called Lovejoy ISD, and um, it's been very carefully managed from the start. The idea from the very beginning um, has been to kind of erect invisible barriers so that only certain kind of families get in. And really that's largely done through the zone and code and through the housing market. And so the very first time I went on the tour of the big, amazing high school there, you know, we're walking around and I was seeing the engineering wing and the visual arts wing and you know, all of these amenities and resources. Um, but, you know, I had looked at the demographics of Lovejoy compared to like Allen or Plano right next door. And very different, you know, Plano was at this point, you know, a third white and, uh, you know, there a high, you know, relatively high number of students who are considered low income and still learning English. Um, but Lovejoy right next door, more or less, had still kind of it was still 75 percent white, less than three percent poor, only a handful of English learners. And so I said, what do you attribute those differences to? And the answer I got was septic tanks. And I was like, wait a second, I don't understand this at all. And so it kind of came out that the way the local zoning code was engineered was that you can only build really large, expensive houses on large lots that have their own private uh, waste treatment. And so what that means, in effect, and this is what I was told the first time I took this tour, was that not a single child in that school district lives in an apartment. And so you see this kind of like old vision of like, okay, who are the suburbs and their resources for? you know, kind of concentrated very clearly here. Like these are the families that are considered quote unquote, most desirable, most valuable. And so all of this money and attention and subsidy and resource goes into drawing them in. But part of the tension that the community ends up facing is that, you know, you need to both say, sustain and maintain what you've already built and you need to build new things and provide new services. And the way that you do that in the suburbs, it takes money and the money comes from growth. But oftentimes that growth is at odds with this idea of we need to remain exclusive to keep our property values up and our values the way that we think that they should be. And so that community is really, uh, you know, kind of in the middle of that, as I write the book of kind of like trying to navigate these tensions. But what we've seen again and again and again across the country is that what ultimately happens is that the families who are wealthiest and wealthiest and whitest end up just leaving that behind. They say, OK, we'll go start somewhere else where we can start cycle over where we have new and abundant resources that work and don't need this repair right now. And they leave those communities behind. And someone ends up getting stuck with the bill for all those opportunities that have already been extracted. And because of the racialized pattern of us in America, that is often black and brown and poor and immigrant families who think they're buying in to this kind of old suburban dream where you get this great social contract and all of these benefits and resources. And then what you wake up one day and realize is not only is my experience very different, especially in the schools where my kid is often unfairly disciplined, subjected to slurs and harassment, doesn't have any teachers who look like him or her, et cetera, et cetera. But I've also been stuck with the tab for paying for the opportunities that this previous generation of families already extracted. You know, and what's so interesting here, actually, I'll ask you this question. What I want to hear you unpack your thoughts around what you think opportunity is and what it means, because you keep referring to opportunities being extracted um, mm -hmm. as if it's inherently kind of not like a zero sum game, but kind of like that, like it's like a resource um, that's finite. Kind of unpack that and how reporting on these five different families and communities kind of took you in that direction of thinking about it that way? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think about our opportunity in the suburbs, and particularly for families with kids, on kind of like a spectrum. So on one hand, there's these real financial benefits, guaranteed mortgage loans, um, you know, massive tax breaks for homeowners, uh, you know, 
low property tax rates in many communities, especially for their first few generations. There are real financial benefits that are what allow us to build generational wealth and what have allowed past generations to build generational wealth, particularly through home ownership in the suburbs. Um, so there's that very kind of tangible, concrete sense of opportunity. But there's also um, public schools and the public schools really being in many cases the center of these communities because they are seen as conveyors to middle, upper middle class security. Their job is to get um, you know the, the kids of the families who move in to a better life than their parents had. Um, and so that becomes part of the uh, the opportunity to get as well. But then I think what we lose track of and what I, you know, I tried to bring into this book based on my background as an education reporter is there's all these kind of like small, intimate, personal moments that happen in schools that reflect that too. And mm -hmm. I'll give you just one example from my own experience. You know, I write a little bit about how I grew up outside of uh, Pittsburgh in an inner ring suburb called Ten Hills. And this was in the 1970s and 80s when the community was still mostly white. You know, my family's white. My teacher was white. Um, and... Um, you know, in third grade, I started getting bored really a lot. And so what I would do, I would finish my work, I would get bored and I would start drawing on my desk, which is really annoying if you're a teacher. But instead of punishing me, what my teacher did was say, okay, she brought in her typewriter from home and set it up in the back of the classroom and said, when you get bored, don't draw on your desk, get on the typewriter and do whatever you want. She really kind of like turned me loose. And I ended up starting a class newspaper. It was my first newspaper job. I was up to date with room 38. And so, you know, it was really valuable for me in the moment. You know, it helped me socially. It gave me kind of an outlet for my curiosity. I got to try new things, learn how to fail and keep going. You know, all of those kind of educational benefits. But there was also this sense that the community that I was a part of and the institutions that I was in relationship with cared for me and extended grace to me and recognized me and sought to nurture my talents. And that's a kind of opportunity that's kind of hard to put your finger on until you see the differences when a family's getting it and when the opposite is happening and the institution is actually punitive or predatory or just dismissive. You know, and maybe this is poor reading comprehension on my part, but I just understand why you made such a big deal um, in uh, Compton about a precocious young kid. Um, he's promised that though he's similarly precocious. Um, he's promised a, a newsletter, a newspaper, you know, it's the 21st century. So these things are a little more complicated mm -hmm. than a typewriter, mm -hmm. but he's promised like this class class project led by this like great teacher. Um, it never really comes about during the first semester and then COVID happens. So understanding that juxtaposition actually makes right. a lot more sense when you put it that way. Right. And I think, you know, it's a part of what became you know, why I chose to tell the story from five different communities and five different families at the same time is because this Ponzi scheme dynamic that we're talking about of, you know, it working well for the early generations who extract all the resources and then push the costs off onto future generations is that that was really built fundamentally on racial and economic exclusion. And so the benefits of the Ponzi scheme were available to families like mine. And what we're seeing now is the costs of that are being borne by somebody else. But what, make Comp what makes Compton so powerful and what made Jacob Hernandez, who's the fourth grader that I start following at the beginning of the book, just so compelling to me is that what was happening uh, in Compton Unified School District and in Jefferson Elementary and in his classroom and in his family and in his life was saying, here's a student who is or a child who is in many ways, you know, exactly the kind of kid that suburb suburbs long have tried to keep out and have long tried to keep treat as a problem, particularly because his parents are undocumented and they don't speak English very well. But what the school system is doing from top to bottom is saying, no, we are going to lavish you with opportunity as well. And opportunity in all of those ways, financial resources, you know, are, are poured into the school, but also we are going to pay attention to you. We are going to recognize who you are. We are going to try to find your gifts and nurture them. And so he ends up getting to try not just, you know, starting out with a class newspaper, but he's in a mock trial competition. He does app challenges. There's a robotics club. So he gets to imagine himself in all of these different futures, not just as a kind of someone who the future is happening to or will happen to, but someone who's expected to shape it himself. And he really walks away from that, you know, elementary school with that in his mind. And I think that's an immensely powerful thing. You know, here's something I'm curious about then, um, because I want to make the unsustainability of the model part clear for folks, because I think I went to like an affluent high school um, from Lake Oswego, Oregon, so like an affluent suburban uh, bedroom community. I see a school. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's like really nice, but everyone pays their property taxes and like, that's the deal, but it's made up for the fact that our home values are high. Talk about the unsustainability from the perspective of your hometown outside of Pittsburgh, the right. bad, uh, what's the term? Uh, the, 
I'm forgetting the actual term for this, but basically like at a structural level, the schools don't work. The the facilities, the so talk about that side of things and how this intersects with bonds and tax increases and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think what happens is, you know, to, the first thing to remember is a lot of these communities, particularly the post-war suburbs, they really were built almost overnight, like in the blink of an eye, you know, five, 10 years, all of a sudden it goes from, uh, you know, farms and, and, and countryside to subdivisions and strip malls. And so they're built very quickly. And they're built with a lot of subsidies. So the government is paying for roads and infrastructure. The local municipalities are borrowing money for that. Um, services and I mean, taxes are kept very low from the beginning in order to entice people in. And there's the sense of like, oh, we can just have all of these things without really having to pay full freight for them because the subsidies and because the taxes are kept low. And so that works wonderfully for those first generations of families and maybe even the second, possibly even the third. Like my family was really the third generation of family into Penn Hills. And we were really the last to be able to, part of that last generation that really enjoyed that full bounty of what Penn Hills once offered. Um, because eventually all of that infrastructure, all of those schools, everything, sidewalks, roads, sewer systems, it gets old and you have to fix it. And that's really expensive and no one's paying for that anymore. So all of a sudden, you have to start as a municipality, or as a township, a jurisdiction, you have to start raising taxes. You have to start encouraging more density and growth, which often means, you know, expanding your population base. It's, you know, all of these things that were not part of the, the kind of fabric of that community from its outset. Now, all of a sudden, you have to change that in order to bring in uh, the resources that you need and solve the problems that you have. And what happens is families like mine, as you know, literally in the case of Penn Hills, like we left before the bill came due for that. Um, and so part of what the book is is trying to argue and part of what I want to do with it is to say, you know, we have to look at what we've left behind and be accountable to that as well. So what's the answer to what's been left behind beyond like federal or state bailouts? So one of the things that became so fascinating about the COVID um, era for schools was there was a lot of money. You know, the, the ESSER, the, the um, education emergency dollars for COVID that were handed to school districts, like that was into the billions and billions of dollars. And so what we saw was that in a place like Penn Hills, all of a sudden, there were some resources on hand to start to address these systems problems in a small way. You know, there were boilers that are broken. Now we have money to fix the boiler. Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of things kind of cleaning up some past mistakes. But what we see is that even though, you know, that, you know, small 4,000 student school district ended up getting $18 million. It's still a drop in the bucket given what it needs and it's not recurring. And so, you know, I, part of the argument that I walk away from writing Disillusioned with is that we need to really think as a country about what making, you know, taking that original investment we made in suburbia in the post-war years of, you know, well, subsidized higher education, subsidized housing, you know, all of those opportunities, but really only gave them to a narrow slice of the population for a limited uh, you know, duration and say, how do we come up with a version of that that is far more inclusive, that kind of works for everyone and is at least a little bit more sustainable than what we have now? Okay. I'd love to hear what do you think that looks like, right? Because the, the, And this is why reading this in post-war history is helpful because post-war, once again, um, let's put aside race, the race issue for a second, as if that's not almost everything. But the answer is GI bills for vets. We're going to expand the highways, not just for domestic reasons, but also for national security reasons. We are going to increase the amount of people who go to college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's very much like the framework model. Like, what would you say is the starting framework model from a we have these problems, but also opportunities in the 2020s perspective? I mean, I think that the core of it and the core of why suburbs matter so much to so many Americans is because they're about investing in kids. It, but it's historically, we've made decisions about some kids we will invest in and some we won't. And so the first part is really kind of saying, like, taking a look at the population of America right now and saying, in all of its glory and complexity and diversity, especially in suburbia, like we have to invest in a new generation of kids that is far more diverse than that post-war generation that got to benefit from the suburbs up front. So that's first. But I think they're also, you know, there is, it's important to be realistic too, and that many of these communities in Penn Hills, where I grew up, is a great example. Like it was built on a really, really flawed foundation both conceptually and materially. So this idea that we can just kind of constantly keep growing and the money will come in and it magically allows us to not have to take care of our responsibilities is really endemic in a lot of suburbs. And then also this sense of like, um, the infrastructure is often really bad. 
the services aren't really there. Like if you think about it, a lot of these suburban communities were really built for families from one socioeconomic background, one racial background, one age, one point in their life, where it's really for young families, young, white, upwardly mobile families. And so it's, you know, it's much more affordable and straightforward to provide services for one group of people who all share a common set of needs. But when the community is a lot more diverse and you know racially, ethnically, um, age-wise, all these different ways that you think about, all of a sudden it means, okay, how do we think about doing this in a much more complicated environment? I guess the thing that, and I think this is a, we can have a whole discourse on the limits of like 1990s liberalism, mm -hmm. but if we're looking from a 1990s liberalism perspective, um, like I said, um, grew up in Lake Oswego, like Lake Oswego was nicknamed Lake No Negro because until the 1970s, like there were literally um, restricted covenants. And then obviously at a structural level, there's still a very small, it also to be fair to Lake Oswego, um, it's Oregon. So it's not as if there's like a trillion black people in the first place, but the point is still um, not that diverse from a um, black person um, perspective. But 1990s liberalism would basically say, look, everyone wants this American dream. The flaw is that um, there are restrictive covenants, and then we therefore need to admit more people to that dream, so on and so on and so forth. But to your point, though, if we're thinking differently from like an age perspective, from a demographic perspective, from an ethnicity perspective, how does our conception of the suburbs then change if we don't just assume the solution is let everyone back into that 1950s model because it was bad we didn't let them have it in the first place? Right. And I think that, you know, kind of gets, we talked earlier about kind of the different dreams that animate different communities and what you're describing, that kind of equal access to opportunity Amer version of the American dream that was really kind of a direct outgrowth of the civil rights movement. Like that's very much what we see animating the development of the Atlanta suburbs. Um, and you see these kind of successive rings of development with black middle class families trying to get into communities where they have great public schools and amenities and good home values and all of that and kind of the rug kind of continually getting pulled out first in DeKalb County, then in Southern Gwinnett County, now in Northern Gwinnett County. And so this kind of same pattern keeps repeating. And so that's really this, I mean, in many ways, what the, the disillusionment that the book describes is really all about that, that, that vision that um, has in it, that nineties liberal vision that you described, like that's animated the development and diversification of a lot of suburbs. But when families are kind of having this reckoning of like both my personal experience with my child in the schools or with my neighbors down the street is not what I expected or want or ex think is acceptable, but also the costs to get way less are going way up, like that is profoundly disillusioning because there's nowhere else to go. And so part of the challenge, though, is that, like you said, it's not just a matter of we can take this thing that's working for some people now and expand it. We have to rethink the foundations of the communities. And that's a very expensive, time-consuming, politically fraught process. Because so I think you can make the argument that, you know, just pouring tons of tax dollars, for example, into a community that was built on a bad foundation and is starting to crumble as a result of that, like you don't want to throw good money after bad. And there's like, there's some, there's reason to think that through. Um, but what it does not, you know, what we do have to leave space for, though, is like even we have to get creative about thinking about how we are going to bring that kind of investment and resources to the families who live in suburbia now, even though the foundations of the communities that they've inherited are often so fraught. I'd like to hear more about Atlanta because I think Atlanta is interesting because you're once again focusing um, on this black uh, middle class family like Atlanta, Houston. Like we're seeing like these new centers of like black middle class wealth. And that's a very like good thing, but we are going to see like these real tension points. And it seems like the big tension point in that family is school discipline. Um, and uh, to be honest, like that was kind of a, a harder like chapter for me just because. On the one, so and actually, let me just let me just play like a generic like parent who's kind of confused about this um, section. So just you know, by my back, the audience knows this, but like I'm, my last name's Kozlov. I'm obviously adopted. I grew up in a very like normal upper middle class uh, American Jewish family. Um, so when I'm reading those chapters, like on the one hand, I could understand um, racial dynamics. I could understand like being in these new spaces, but I don't understand. I basically want to put this way. I understand like a white impulse to say like, why can't this kid just behave? And like, why does, why, why is this kid's inability to like just function properly in awkward situations? Uh, something that we as a suburban society are responsible for. Yeah. And I think it's a great question. And I think it comes out and like at multiple different levels at once. So there's this kind of interpersonal level where, you know, teachers work really hard and it's a really hard job. 
And so we like in a lot of the suburbs of that vintage that, you know, I, I talk about in the book. And if you just kind of look around the country, what you'll see is they have really kind of established experienced teaching staff. People have been there 15 years, 20 years, 25 years in the classroom. And it's predominantly white teaching staff. And they've over that time kind of developed these practices and habits and routines and protocols and kind of ways of, you know, just managing the day-to-day -day of a classroom and all of the impossibility that comes with that, that they've kind of had their tried and trusted and true methods for that. But then the population of their class starts to change, the kids start to change, and they're unable or unwilling to adapt. And then all of this friction kind of starts to happen as a result of that. And so, the, you know, at kind of like a basic level, it's like, well, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to respond to the needs or experiences or values or cultural styles, linguistic styles of this new population. But there's also the sense that um, things are changing, that I'm, that I'm losing something, something's being taken away. And we saw that in the, again, in back in Gwinnett County a lot, where there was this real mismatch between the, the population of the county and the public schools, which is now overwhelmingly non-white. And up until 2018, the school board and the leadership of the district, which was entirely white, had never had a school board member of color until 2018, and was mostly older and, and Republican. And so when I talked to the, you know those, those school board members who had been around forever, in one case on the board for 47 years, you know, there was this kind of common collective sense of like, we built this place and made it what it is that all these people now want to come to it. So why do you want to change it after we've already built it up and made it so good? And they really see it as kind of diluting or watering down the quality of this thing that they built up rather than saying, hey, how do we take that same principle of investing in kids, creating opportunities, providing abundant supports and adapt it and adjust it to the different um, students and families that we now serve. And I guess here's a real question. And this is uh, uncomfortable slash awkward, but at multiple times throughout the book, you seem you, you're you're talking about the white teachers versus the black teachers. You imply multiple times that the black teachers, like older black teachers, were much more harsh in their like discipline towards students, um, mm -hmm. specifically like their black students. Um, and maybe you were like suggesting something or not suggesting something. I was just trying to like understand like the meaning behind like that juxtaposition. But there's a ton of uh, empirical research showing the benefits of um, having a same race teacher for you and a, for everybody, but particularly for um, African-American students and having an African-American teacher makes a big difference academically, socially, emotionally. Like There's a wealth of research to that effect. But what we see in a lot of suburban districts, again, is there's a real mismatch. There's very few teachers of color and especially black teachers and especially black male teachers. But that is increasingly the population that those schools serve. So for a lot of families, particularly families of color, those moments when they do get to have a classroom teacher who looks like them and their child like become very powerful and become very poignant. And so, you know, from my perspective, what I saw and, and heard kind of repeatedly was not so much that it was like strict or overly punitive or disciplined, but that there was a sense of like high expectations, yes, but also support and understanding that went with it. And so oftentimes what that looked like was in the classroom, I'm not going to let you get away with all of this nonsense that you're doing in your other classes. But when I see you in the hallway, when I talk to your mom, when you get some new sneakers, when all of these little moments that kind of become these personal touch points that say, I care about you. I value you, I see you, I know you, and that's why I'm holding you to this high standard rather than it coming across as punitive makes a big difference. So I guess, Here's the real question here, and this is where this gets so, I think, difficult in 2024 America. Hearing what you just said about the impact of like same race teachers on student achievement, on the one hand, I get what you're saying from an empirical social science perspective. On the other hand, it seems like a devastating, what do I possibly do with that uh, in notion? Uh, because I think the school board juxtaposition is really interesting because like, once again, it's a school board, it's setting policies, actually like it totally... You don't have to make racial art, like they're demographic, like there are a bunch of different, like you profile, um, you know, some like, people running for school board. There are a variety of not just racially based reasons to like diversify the school board away from people who've been on the board for decades and decades and decades who no longer have the same vested relationship. Um, but when it comes to like teacher pop teacher populations, I kind of react to what, so like, do we need to like have a quota of like, we want the racial admixture of teachers to match the percentages of like the students. That seems not, not, I'm not saying that's dystopian, but it seems like such a, it seems like an admittance of defeat. Do you kind of get what I'm saying? But it, 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 it feels as if like the American society we'd want to live in is an American society where we've 
figured out education to the degree to which we could drop a kid in a public school and that kid will be educated regardless of like race, color, creed, et cetera. Yeah, and I think this is you know part of the challenge and the trick for Americans in particular, I think, is that we we often are not very good at holding both our individual experiences and stories and these kind of sociological patterns that we're a part of at the same time. It's hard, you know, I think a lot of times for us to look at look at both at the same time. And so why I say that is because I think what you'll see is that um not every black teacher is a good teacher for black children or for other children. There's lots of bad black teachers out there too. And so it's not like you're just going to magically solve anything by hiring a few black teachers. There's kind of an aggregate level where you see, you know, the benefits of a diverse workforce. Um, but that doesn't necessarily imply that every single classroom is going to change based on change staffing patterns. Um, and then at the same time, what you see is there are lots of white and, and non-black educators who take this stuff really seriously and work at it very hard. You know, in Evanston, I talk about a white principal um, who has really kind of like spent 10 years really digging her hands into like the nuts and bolts of how to think about the ways schools operate more equitably and fairly. And it comes up in ways that like, don't make headlines in this case, in this particular school in Evanston. Uh, it comes up in ways of like saying, okay, I'm not going to spend hours on the phone with affluent parents who are trying to pressure me into putting their child into, with the teacher they want. I'm going to set a clear boundary there and I'm going to use that time to um, refocus my staff on how do we help struggling readers or, you know, things like how do we, you know, kind of put together um, grade level reading material for second graders who aren't yet reading at second grade level to make sure they're not falling behind on content, but they're also getting this support and they're not just being lost. Like all of these like pedagogical and policy and cultural changes that are really hard. Um, there's lots of, you know, white educators and what, uh, you know, educators of color who are not necessarily the same as their students who do great work with that. The challenge is trying to do that at scale. You know, before we get to Evanston, I'd love to ask you another question about the Atlanta suburbs. I'm curious how this book informed your perspective around an issue like school choice. Um, because within that fam, so I'm coming from Texas, right? So a lot of my Texas context in school choice is like, okay, like a lot of like school choice stuff is, you know, thinly veiled, like anti public education. Um, perspectives where there's like an underlying hostility to public school. And if we could do this, this or that, like whatever, but like very clearly um, in that suburban situation, like there's this special high school um, that's within, you know, driving distance, but it takes like a slightly different perspective on a lot of like the issues that like the family is like struggling with. And they're like holding out that school as this alternative to like their tracked suburban public school experience. Um, so I'm just curious, that was just like an interesting kind of like, if there was a good faith articulation of what a good school choice system would look like for me, it's just really that. So I'd love to hear how about you, you kind of reflect on that. Thanks. Yeah. I think, you know, part of the first part is that we often, because of the politics of it, I think we often end up taking a, a you know, an, an insufficiently wide view of what school choice actually looks like in America, because there's this whole vast, um, kind of dimension of school choice. That's about where people choose to live. And that is driven heavily by schools, particularly for young families and parents. Um, they're choosing where they live because they want the, the access to the public schools there. And so you could know, say, yeah, I'm going to a public school. I'm not going to a charter school or a private school, or I'm not using a voucher. But you've already kind of exercised your choice by being able to you know, buy into a housing market that people who don't have the resources that you do might not be able to. So school choice is happening all the time, um, not just in a decision about traditional public school versus charter school. But yeah, I mean, what part of what was you know, eye-opening for me, and I think really became kind of a crucial part for me of understanding what was happening in sub suburbs and schools through this lens of disillusionment, was this idea of like, there are lots of options that families are pursuing, particularly Black families in the suburbs. So saying, okay, there's, you know, a growing number of charter schools, there's private schools, there's homeschooling, there's all of these kind of different options, but none of them are giving me that same version of the American dream that I thought I was getting just by virtue of moving into this community. So not only am I paying all the property taxes now, but now I'm having to navigate this kind of sea of choices, none of which actually feel right. And so it is very, like as a parent, I think it's very overwhelming. Like you wanna make the right choice and you wanna feel good about where your kid's going to school and you know all of those things. And when you can't do that, it's very upsetting. Um, and then also it's like becomes this kind of, it just wears you down of having to like constantly think about it and figure it all the time. 
So let's uh, transition to the real like race and equity um, area. We'll talk about Evanston, Evanston, um, Illinois. Um, you know what's interesting about that story? I think there are two two anecdotes that kind of uh, get to the core of the issue here. So one was a point of real frustration I had with a parent um, the profile, which is you know it's 2019. There are these like race and equity like culture war issues happening at the school, and like one of the parents gets mad at a white parent for not wanting to read um, the book White Fragility. Um, it's 2019. Uh, and that was just like a small anecdote. I'm not expecting you to like discourse in it, but like that for me was just sort of like, there really was this like 2019 Trump era moment that I think upon reflection, I think people don't take that sort of work as seriously as they once did. And if the solution to these things was like, let's, you know, uh, read more white fragility or Abram Kendi, I think we would have solved a certain amount of these problems already. So that was just like a bit of just like, I think frustration I have, but at the same time, I think a really good anecdote you also provided was um, in Evanston, like this school specifically, was it the eighth graders who were performing at a like 12th grade level, like the white, like eighth graders, and then the actual like POCs were performing like at an eighth grade level. On the one hand, like that's really awesome um, because they are a eighth graders. And that still put them among the highest achieving like black people in the country. Mother hand, like there's still a four year grade gap within the same school. So the white parents were super excited. The black parents were not excited. So I could I could start by dunking on white fragility and like equity things, but like I can understand if I were a parent, um, I would not just be happy with that status quo either. So we just love any reflection you have on all of this. Yeah. And you know, this is probably why it's so exciting to be on this podcast with you and get to talk about it. Cause you've been this is what your work is, right? This realignment yeah. of on all of the things that are happening here. And, you know, this kind of schism between the kind of traditional liberal left and the younger uh progressive left is like we're seeing that in the 2024 cycle already, you know, with all of the concerns about Biden. And I think it's been very pronounced, uh, certainly since 2016, um, you know, for, for sure before that, but it really kind of came to the surface. And so Evanston is a place where that's really playing out in like kind of real time. And, you know, you, you you mentioned this dynamic. It was like, for me, it really became so crystal clear when I heard this. So there was this researcher named Sean Reardon, and he's at Stanford University. And he had done this massive study of, you know, based on test scores to see, you know, what achievement gaps look like in different parts of the country. It's like 40 million kids. It's huge. And so he comes to Evanston and he shows them this chart. And it basically shows that Evanston has one of the, like the top three or four largest racial achievement gaps in the country even though the economic gaps between its white population and its black population are kind of more or less typical, they're not extreme. And so it becomes this Rorschach test that kind of inflames this tension between liberals and progressives. The liberals look at that and say, hey, you know, uh, you know, the, there's a problem that's happening here that starts before kids get to school. So we need to invest in early childhood. We need to, you know, do all of these kinds of things, which is a lot of research to support. But then progressives say, hey, we have a lot of well-to-do Black families in this community. And if you look at the numbers for their kids, they're still struggling and they're still underperforming relative to their white peers. And that's because something must be happening in school that at minimum is not fixing this and is by many indications making it worse. And so that becomes this very different solution that flows from that around, hey, we need to really think about changing people's hearts and minds. We need to talk about racial equity all day, every day. We need to make that the core of every decision that we make and start thinking about changing budgets, personnel, policies, really from the ground up. And those two visions, even though they're both, you know, center left, are very, you know, incompatible in many ways when you're dealing with the limited resources of a particular suburban community. And so that starts playing out in Evanston in real time. And part of what I think, you know, what drew me there and part of why I think it's so valuable to this kind of national conversation we're having, because in many ways, like as much as any other school district in the country, and particularly any suburban school district, Evanston and District 65, which controls its elementary and middle, middle schools, you know, they pushed this further than just about anyone in terms of, you know, their equity statements, the audits that they did, changing personnel, changing policies, changing discipline codes, changing dress codes, you know, all this kind of detracking math, this whole kind of equity progressive playbook, all of it got implemented there. And things didn't just magically work out as a result of that. And so that, again, feeds into this disillusionment of like, hey, even if we're doing all of these things that the most progressive among us want to do, it's still hard to see the change that we want to make. And it kind of leaves us in this place of like, well, what do we do? I guess the real question then, and, and I think um, a good example of what we're talking about, I was slightly unfair by kind of like raising, but basically like reducing the progressive side of the argument to wanting people to read white fragility. Um, because I think the actual like, one of the beginning 
realities that brought this issue to the core in the school district was like multiple instances of like actual like racial slurs and bullying not being handled properly and not just like a you know oh this is like a microaggression like a microaggression like being called like actual racial slurs a, a parent the first time says politely to the you know teacher principal hey can we deal with this it happens again it happens again, it happens again, it happens again. So I think that's a better articulation of like the structural issues that the yeah. progressives were concerned about rather than like the white fragility stuff. But I think the thing that where this becomes difficult, and I think we're just kind of left in a disillusioned state to your point is, okay, like let's be real. The fact that a kid in third grade is being called monkey on the playground probably doesn't explain at a literal level that four year gap. So there's this like weird space we're in um, that leaves people without a unsatisfying answer beyond the work continues, which doesn't seem to be a politically sustainable approach from either direction. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's part of why I chose to really focus on telling this story from parents' perspective. And so um, Lauren Edesina is a mom that I got to know in Evanston. And she's multiracial. Her mom is Ecuadorian and her dad Nigerian. And so, uh, you know, and her son presents as black. And so he, you know, just like you're describing, you know, he ends up his first year, first grade, he's at school and he gets, um, uh, a racial slur directly. And so I think like sometimes, you know, again, I say this even as an education journalist and certainly as a white man too, of like, you know, we hear those things and we think that's really awful. And then like, it's hard sometimes to sit with how profoundly upsetting that is for a parent and a family and a caregiver and for the child themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of what we saw is like the, with the rise of progressivism in Evanston, for example, is say, hey, this stuff's been happening forever. We just haven't talked about it. And mm -hmm. it ha we thought we, you know, if we put the faith in kind of incremental change, we would build towards a better day. But here we are 20, you know, 18, and my child is still being told this at school. So I don't have time for these excuses or moderation now. What we need to do is like look at root causes and get at those. And I think, you know, part of what I walk away with, particularly in kind of an educational context, context is that there's, a, I think, a lot to be said for the diagnosis that um, a lot of progressives of color in particular are making public education and some of the root causes of the problems. Like it's, you know, kind of really digging into the systems and the histories of, of those systems to understand the ways that it kind of perpetuates and reinforces these patterns. But that's not the same thing as the diagnosis. And so the, the diagnosis becomes like, okay, are we going to do racial literacy training by having everyone read white fragility? Or are we going to adopt new policies and statements? Are we going to try and change the budget around? Are we going to try and do a little bit of all of it? And the reality is right now, we don't have a lot of good roadmaps for doing that. We can't, we don't have like a playbook that you can point to and say, this is what will work. And so people in communities are trying to figure that out. Um, and because it's so fraught and because the politics of it are so laden, um, the backlash comes very quickly. And then it ends up you know, consuming all of the energy in the room. Yeah, and I think given what you just said, as we're going to this last section, you kind of helped reconcile what my actual frustration is. Because as to your point, like there needs to be a national conversation. There have to be models. And I didn't like how at the end of the day, the, the Evans, at what happens at Evanston for good or for ill is just not a model. Because that's a unique example where the center left and the progressives have just total control over the situation. It's an intra-left battle versus like, if we're looking at these dynamics in like a Texas school, put aside like anti-CRT, anti-wokeism, like school board revolts, you are just not gonna have a debate about privilege rocks in the Dallas suburbs. Therefore, if that can do something to help a racial equity issue, it's not scalable behind some like very specific, driven by broader, like for the fact that, you know, Evanston is like where Northwestern University is dynamics. So I'm just like really, I think what's so frustrating about seeing the downsides of like the 1990s liberals consensus that you're telling here is that offered an answer, get rid of the explicit racism, say it doesn't matter if your neighbor is black, brown, red, yellow, whatever, have them welcome them in, then our schools will educate them well, and then we'll throw them no child left behind to catch everyone else. That just clearly doesn't work. And I think that leaves everyone, if they're looking at this in good faith, like in a very frustrating position. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think it, um, you know, it feeds that disillusion that we've been talking about. And I think part of what was just, again, so powerful for me and, and you know, honestly kind of surprising and it took me a while to recognize it was thinking about Compton actually as an example of what the other side of this looks like. So, you know, I approached this book, um, and, you know, the deeper I got into the research, the stronger this kind of conviction became that like we're really at the beginning of this kind of period of turmoil that is going to, you know, really, I think, define much of American life and particularly 
especially suburban life over the next few decades. Like this, the, the, the forces underpinning this of demographic change, housing markets, sustainability issues, like those aren't going away. So I think there's lots of reason to believe that this is going to kind of continue and intensify as those things actually, those forces become stronger. And so then the question becomes, okay, what does a model for the future look like? And I walked away from the five communities and families that I followed feeling like we need to be paying a lot of attention to Compton and to particularly to Compton Unified. And, you know, I know some people will, you know, hear that and say, well, A, Compton is not a suburb anymore. Why are we even talking about that? But it does have the suburban roots. Just because there's no white people there anymore doesn't mean it's not a suburb. Um, but then also, uh, you know, the school system was terrible for a long time, decades. One of the worst in California, taken over by the state, then almost taken over by the state again. Corruption, no performance. I mean, you name it. But when I went there and I started spending time with the, the boy Jacob that we talked about earlier, and I started sitting in on his fourth grade classroom and meeting his teachers and meeting his principal and talking to the superintendent and the administrators at a district level, you know, what became very clear was they, again, saw the, the not only the value, but the imperative of investing in the kids that were in front of their teachers in the classroom. And they weren't doing it like, so the, the question for them became, how do we do that? And it wasn't this like explicit racial progressive conversation that was happening. In fact, it was kind of the opposite. Like in Compton, you had you know 20 years at this point of these really profound, more 25, 30 years, really profound black brown tensions that had come as a result of you know black families in Compton and black civic leadership in Compton really kind of gaining control of the town and being very exclusionary in their own right when it came to patronage jobs and contracts and elected seats and committees and you know, everything you can think of. And there was a lot of frustration for a long time. But what you know, when I talk to the current superintendent there now, a man named Darren Brawley, who's African-American, he was very reticent to talk about the politics of it all. And not because he didn't think about it, but because I think he had really seen that for him, the big picture was making that investment and that that required having a vision that every you know both sides of the community could really get behind. And that if he waded into those waters, he was only going to make things worse. So his strategy was, you know, let's do the work and make the investments um, and kind of try and frame it as a vision that, you know, diverse groups and communities can kind of get behind. And he's seeing some early successes with it. And so I think, you know, first and foremost, that idea of these are the kids we need to invest in. And then second, you know, being open and flexible about what those kind of diagnoses and conversations look like from there. Yeah. So for these last two uh, big questions. Um, so number one, um, you're you're a broad education reporter, and I kind of find in these conversations about um, the suburbs and access, they often reduce themselves to like a yimbyism versus nimbyism debate. Like, you know, all these rich people or middle class people are throwing up barriers to these entree points that people need to pursue the American dream. But from an early two thousands perspective, right when I become you know, politically cognizant, it seems kind of depressing in the sense that like, if we reduce education policy to a Yimby NIMBY debate, what we're actually saying is we no longer have any faith that we can be transformational where people are. So we've essentially reduced education policy through the housing market to this like lifeboat strategy where like, look, what we've got to do is like get as many like black kids, Hispanic kids, whatever, into these suburbs as possible. And like that's our solution versus, once again, No Child Left Behind has a million different issues. But I think upon reflection, we could see, I think there's something a little positive around the idea of like, hey, like by doing this, 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 and that, like where people live right now, we can make their schools better. As an education reporter, I'd love you to kind of like respond to that dynamic I'm picking up. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, you know I really had to reflect on and kind of get get with myself about was, you know, even though I'd been covering schools for almost fifteen years, you know, I had never fully appreciated um, the kind of complexities of school integration and desegregation within many Black communities, um, and this sense of like it's not about the integration per se; it's about the resources. And so, you know, kind of that debate and that kind of back and forth that really kind of goes all the way back to the 1940s and 50s and kind of still seeing it, um, I had really, you know, failed to understand a lot of that until I started reading and talking and doing this work in, in suburbia and saying, oh, wait, this is what's happening again and again, where you see, again, a place like Evanston, where they desegregated their elementary and middle schools in 1968. And it was done by closing the elementary school in the black neighborhood of town and busing the black kids to other schools in whiter parts of town. So that um, instead of having one school where almost all the black kids went and other schools that were almost entirely white, now you have every school, uh, every elementary and middle school in Evanston that's you know roughly 20, 25 percent black. 
And so it was hailed as a national model. Like they did, they were the first Northern district to, you know, integrate all of their um, elementary and middle schools. There were no riots. There wasn't people throwing rocks at buses. There was a lot of tension, but there was none of the outright violence that we saw in a lot of other places. And they sustained it through to, you know, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, even right up until now, until this recent period, this, you know, 2016, 2018, when it's Mm -hmm. like, we have tried this and we are tired of it not working. And so where I kind of leave Evanston and the school district there kind of politically at the end of the moment is they're backing away from this 50 year history of desegregation and racial balance in its schools and saying what we're going to do is we're going to you know take our limited resources and we're going to rebuild an elementary school that's the neighborhood school for that black community in the fifth ward there um, and really kind of step back from this focus that we've had for the last 50 years. And I think that's a really significant thing that kind of gets crystallized in Evanston, but we see versions of that happening, um, not just in other school districts and schools around the country, but within individual families, within individual hearts and minds of saying, I had this you know, vision of what a suburb could be if it was you know, based on these kind of principles of equal opportunity and integration and so forth. And that just hasn't panned out and I need to keep my kids safe. So here is how we'll close. We're close where we began. I made reference to the, you know, post-2008 pro-urbanization, anti-suburban trend. Seems like COVID and just like the aftermath has kind of thrown a real wrench in this discourse in the sense that like, perfect example, um, I spent COVID in DC, you know, DC just lost, um, you know, the capitals and the wizards to the Virginia suburbs. That's kind of like the opposite. And once again, these things are complicated, but just at a narrative level, the crime narrative and the end of the low interest rate tech is venture capital is subsidizing the urban lifestyle for millennials part has this left us without like a unified narrative. And my kind of thesis here is that as housing becomes more and more expensive, um, suburbs are going to weirdly come back into fashion as this like unattainable thing that people want as this luxury good in the same way that the kind of like 2013 post-crisis uh brooklyn williamsburg lifestyle was like really like this like thing millennials were searching for i'm curious how you would close where we find the narrative uh there i mean i think in some ways it feels like you know the kind of almost this literal experience for me of kind of going back home to this place I had left behind and seeing it with fresh eyes. And I think that's part of what I'm hoping the book will kind of open space for, for lots of readers as well around the country to say, hey, we thought we knew what suburbia was and we were always wrong, but we're especially wrong now. And it's kind of being presented to us with this opportunity to really see this place in a new way. And so one of the things that was like a real gift for me was I had grown up in Penn Hills outside of Pittsburgh in the 80s and 90s. I graduated high school in 1994, and I thought it was the most boring place in the world that didn't matter. And if I wanted to have a meaningful career and have an interesting life and have fun and like, you know, meet good people and all that stuff that I had to go to a city or kind of live in a different place. And I did that. And I spent 20 years not really thinking about my hometown at all. But what kind of came out of this process of reporting and research, but also getting to know this mom who had bought the house three doors down from my childhood home and was really having to now confront the reality that she's paying for the opportunities my family enjoyed. And she and I having to work through that together, very painful, very difficult, um, you know, awkward at a lot of times but incredibly rewarding, I think, for the book. And also for me personally, where I have like my relationship to my hometown, my relationship to the suburb that I grew up in changed dramatically of saying, no, this is a place where people have put the best of ourselves, what we want for our kids, our families, our dreams for the future. Um, We've invested all of that into these places. And that's kind of an important, special thing. And the fact that that's kind of crumbling now, that's something we all need to turn our attention to and kind of take care of those places and figure out where the opportunities for repair and reimagination are. Well, Ben, well said. It's a great place to leave the podcast. Can you just give a shout out to the book for listeners and viewers? Sure. It's called Disillusioned, Five Five Families and the Unraveling of American Suburbs. And it's published in in late January with uh, Penguin Press. And you can find out more at benjaminherald.com. Thanks for joining me on The Realignment. Thanks for having me. 